I want to talk about what what a post COVID landscape is going to look like, especially because things are opening up again. Uh, which I, I, my my opinion on that is I I don't I don't know if that's the best thing to do. That's my opinion on it. I don't know if that's the best thing to do right now. Um, uh, I I have said this numerous times on this show, uh, on my podcast Taboo Table Talk, and just in private conversations that I've had <laughs> with a lot of people. <clears throat> Look, opening up the 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 country, opening up small businesses, so on and so forth. Uh, or quarantining and social distancing becomes moot points if you don't have testing and treatment av available for everybody. That's I think that's that's the reality of it. Unless we can test people, unless we and and we can test the most vulnerable in our population. That includes homeless people. That includes poor people. Uh, people living in low income housing. If we can't get them testing, then this becomes a moot point. Um, furthermore, <clears throat> we have to look into what other countries have done in terms of treatment. And I apologize that my throat is so dry. Um, we do have to look at what other countries did for treatment. Um, set up triage centers, uh, actually fund healthcare, which we'll talk about in, in today's episode is, um, that's the only way to move forward right now. Um, um, the, we're, we're having these arguments about vaccines, which I also kind of think is somewhat moot. Um, I think we should be looking into a vaccine, but that's not going to come for another another year. Uh, so, you know, I think um, I think it's kind of silly to 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 be arguing so much about it. What we should be doing is figuring out what we can do to treat people and what we can do to get them tested. Uh, and I don't think we're we're anywhere near that in the United States. We're not even really checking out any sort of treatment options uh, that that I've read. We don't really have triage centers. We don't really have a healthcare system that is equipped to fucking handle anything like this. Um, and you know, so they're just like, oh, we'll flatten the curve and then we'll go back out and then we'll increase the curve and then we'll go back in and we'll flatten the curve again. That's not a way you. It's not a long-term solution to anything because a bunch of industries are just not going to recover, right? Like the entertainment industry will not recover from it, um, and that's as I'm. I'm saying the entertainment industry because I'm part of that industry. So, <clears throat> especially on the smaller scale, it won't recover from it. The only people that are getting um, tests and any sort of medical help are are the richy riches, right? The celebrities and everybody. That's who you see. Um, so I kind of wanted to, 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 to look at, you know, and I'm an optimist, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist. So I'm going to kind of give you the optimist view of what we can do, what the potential, um, is when we talk about a post COVID landscape of things that we can now consider, right? Like things that we can now do, um, in a post COVID landscape, uh, specifically under two, two categories, which is work and labor and mental health. Uh, and I talk about these, um, quite all, like I talk about these these topics all the time um, I think if you pay attention to my channel if you pay attention to all the videos that I put out like I talk about work and labor a ton I talk about mental health stuff a ton uh, they're just stuff that I'm passionate about and I've also said for a long time that labor is going to be the central thing to drive change um, and I think we're we're looking at that point now so one of the things I think we can look at in terms of work and labor is that we are now going to have in a post COVID landscape, a lot more people working from home. A lot more people that can just do their job in their living room, hanging out, right? They don't have to get into their cars and drive fucking 45 minutes or an hour sitting in traffic, you know, cursing, wishing ill upon the drivers next to them, uh, bitching about how people aren't changing lanes properly. And all that shit, all that stress, all that cortisol that gets thrown into your body, and then you show up to work, and you're like ten minutes late, and your boss is like, "Well, it looks like you got a tr you got you're skipping lunch today, or or whatever the fuck it is," <clears throat> and you're disappointed, and you're angry, and, and and then you you hate your cubicle mate because because they won't stop talking about their dumb mediocre kids, and it's like no one cares about your kid, Janet. Okay, no one cares about your kid. We got we got shit to do. I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out how not to fucking turn my tie into a noose. So maybe maybe shut the fuck up. You know, like we don't have to worry about any of that now. You know, I think a lot more people are realizing that they can do their jobs from home. 
Um, and and that's going to mean that we might not need these office buildings. We might not need a cubicle corporate structure anymore, which is great. But it also means that we're going to have a, a bunch of like empty buildings, right? We're going to have a bunch of empty buildings that are going to be of no use. Um, and uh, so what do we do with those empty buildings, right? Now, one of the things you could do is uh, is you could turn them into homeless shelters or uh, places for low-income families to do. There was a project a few years ago, uh, maybe four or five years ago, that I remember reading about that talked about how they were they were taking defunct malls, like malls that were dead, and converting them into apartment complexes and like low income housing apartment complexes too. So like where there was a fucking JC Penny, you, there might be like four or five, you know, low income apartments for people to get back on their feet. And you just live in this former mall. Um, and I think that's an awesome idea. So you could do the same thing with these businesses that are now, that don't have a brick and mortar like a place to go to they might have like a p.o box or something but you know there, there's no actual building to go into to, to to do a thing um even tech jobs you can you can do a lot of tech jobs uh remotely you can connect to a server remotely right so with that with that though you know I, i'm sure that 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 will come with its own difficulties of how do you acquire the like server space? So maybe part of the building that you were in gets converted into server server spaces or something along those lines. I'm not really sure the details of that. Uh, I'm not a server guy. Like I'm not the IT person. So if, if somebody else has a better understanding of that, uh, you know, feel free to leave a comment or, or, or something. Um, I'm sure the ISPs will will try to dominate the field in terms of people working from home, having to use internets a lot more. Uh, they're already trying to do that now. Like Comcast hasn't given anybody a break. Verizon hasn't given anybody a break, right? Spectrum isn't giving anybody a break. They're all fucking still charging people when, especially when people don't have jobs or are struggling to make it through the weeks. Um, they're still charging whatever the fuck for internet. <clears throat> That's just like a thing that they're doing. So, um, you know, I, I'm I'm sure that there will be some way for them to take those business accounts that probably no longer need these these wireless connections and try to make just regular customers try to pay more for it. I'm sure there'll be something like that. Uh, and with Ajit Pai, who is a disgrace to any Indian community because he is a fucking just a what a what a disingenuous shill that guy is. Um, Ajit Pai will, uh, will, will approve the shit out of it. Like he'll be totally fine with <laughs> doing all that, you know, uh, with letting the ISPs raise up the internet prices and everything like that. So, uh, we'll have to keep an eye out for that. We'll have to, we'll have to fight for net neutrality a lot harder, um, in a post COVID landscape, especially with so many people working from home. Now, the other thing you could do with these empty buildings that would show up is vertical farming. Vertical farming is, uh, it's not the, it's not the be all end all solution to a lot of, um, a lot of agricultural problems. Like you can't do root vegetables in, uh, vertical farming. You can do a lot of hydroponic stuff. Um, you can do like herbs and things of that sort. You can't do like potatoes and carrots and shit like that. It just doesn't work with the way that vertical farming does. And I did do a bunch of research about vertical farming. Uh, I want to say almost two years ago, I have a video uh, where I talked about like organic food and, and, and agriculture and farming and things of that sort. Um, and basically within that, it just said like, there are limitations to vertical farming, but you know, the, the industry is growing. It utilizes these spaces a lot more. And, and again, it's like, we are going to run out of space at some point. So we might as well utilize the space we have, um, in a more efficient and productive manner. Like it just makes more sense. So if you end up with a bunch of empty buildings, uh, we might be able to convert them into some vertical farms, which is kind of fucking cool in my opinion. Uh, 
and uh and we uh, and the one thing just like we would have to keep an eye on the fucking isps the corporate isps we would basically have to try to make sure that you don't get somebody like Bayer and uh, Bayer Monsanto and any of these big agribusiness people, to, to, these big agribusiness corporations to come in um, and try to control the vertical farming landscape. Uh, we So that would kind of have to be a little bit of a fight that we would have to go through. Uh, and, um, you know, I think once start, people start working from home, you are going to see a shift within the uh, real estate department as well. I think that's that's fair to say. I think that's fair to say that that we'll we'll end up seeing um, the the real estate industry change quite a bit uh, in terms of like mortgages and rental spaces, right? Like these businesses, if they move out, if if it's like a tech company or something along those lines, um, if they move out and they and a bunch of their employees are working from home and you know now they're occupying one tenth of the space by just like a, a like a server department or something you know um they're not they're not going to be paying rent as much so so now what do the landlords do and now most of the time the in terms of commercial real estate what i've seen is not most of the time i'm not saying this is all the time but you know uh, it's uh it's like a real estate company, right? It's like a corporation that owns most of the larger, um, larger like strip malls and business parks and things of that sort. It's not your. It's not like a. It's not like a fucking guy that owns this building. Like it's a. It's a conglomerate. So they probably also own some residential spaces. And what we would have to look for is to make sure that. Um, you know, we we put in we put in some kind of a rent freeze so that these predatory um, predatory landlords don't jack up people's rents in order to make uh, in order to make more money um, to either even out what they made by by owning these business parks and strip malls and things of that sort, um, or just trying to make more money regardless off of their tenants. Um, so that that's one of the things that you would we would have to kind of put, take a look at especially when it comes to um the work from ho like once more people are working from home right and and they can also say like well you're here a lot more well you're here a lot more you're using the resources a lot more and so on and so forth but none i mean none of that stuff is who gives a shit right like who gives a shit that if, if it's like yeah that's 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 why i live here like i live here to be here i'm allowed to be here because I pay the rent to be here, so why wouldn't I be? If who like you're just gonna raise the rent because I, I live here, more. <laughs> what? <laughs> so if work from home starts to increase, there there would have to be some kind of measures put into place, uh, to cap rents so that landlords can't just arbitrarily raise the rent on people. And I know th there's been a lot of great stories about uh, landlords telling folks like, hey, fucking don't worry about your rent until you pick up on your feet. We'll figure something out. We have savings. We have things in escrow and so on and so forth. But I've also heard some nightmare stories of landlords being dicks. And I've had to deal with my fair share of um, super dick landlords on on various different levels. Like... I've, I've had super dick landlords that were just, you know, just, uh, it's just a guy, right? It's just a guy that bought some places and he manages it now. And that's just what he does. That's the, that's the thing that he does. Uh, and I've also had to deal with the uh, landlords that were part of a real estate company that were also a bunch of dicks. So it, it works in all levels of, you know, so it's just something that we would probably have to see. Um, keep, another thing we would have to keep an eye on, uh, and, and push back on, um, as uh, as as regular folk, the other thing we can see too is without all without having to pay these additional mor mortgages and stuff, these CEOs, uh, that's just more money, right? Like there's they've decreased their expenses. Uh, now what they could do uh, is increase the pay, give give all of their employees a pay bump, um, 
you know, to like better the life of their workers who are making them a bunch of money. Maybe they could do that. Maybe that'd be kind of cool if that happened, right? Uh, but what will likely happen is that the CEOs are going to line their own pockets um, and they're going to make some shit up about uh, having to pay for the pay the boards or the executives or or, or what have you. Um, and they'll and they'll try to line their own pockets and they'll try to hide that extra money. Um, and uh, and you know, and, but but what they'll do and and they do this quite often in all these companies is they'll offer you a bonus. They're like, ah, oh, it's a Christmas bonus. Here's 200 bucks. Huh? Look at you. Huh? This guy working hard Christmas time, 200 bucks right in his pockets. I made an extra 2 million yesterday and I'm going to continue to make $2 million every single day till the end of the year. But you, that you got that 200 bucks, huh? Line in that pocket. Get your, get your dumb kid a, a, a toy or something or whatever. You can probably do that, right? Toys are $200, right? That's good. That's what they do. <laughs> and then everybody just goes, wow, they're so generous. They're so generous, these people. Because <laughs> they gave them one bonus out of the year during, a, during the time when everybody's socially forced to be more giving. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> <laughs> shouldn't we get them an award or something where's time magazine can we make this person person of the year for giving a 200 dollars bonus to some to some poor people that made them a lot of money <laughs> on that same note i do think that uh we're gonna see um the number of strikes grow we're gonna see a lot more strikes uh throughout the year um, especially in a post-COVID landscape, I think we'll see a lot more strikes, um, and and we and we have been right. Go to if you go to paydayreport.com. That's a site that I've started using. Um, instead of just hunting around for this information, which is what I was doing in the beginning of it, the paydayreport.com is an excellent resource uh, where they where they talk about the different strikes that are happening across the country. Uh, highly recommend their site. I've used your site a bunch of times already. Uh, good, good source of research. So um, there's over 200 strikes. I'm going to double check that number uh, right now because I probably should have done it before I started this video, but I totally forgot about it. Um, yeah, so the number right now they're saying is over 220 wildcat strikes that have happened since uh, March of this year. Uh, which is uh, huge. That's a huge number of strikes that have happened this year. Now, I think the tipping point, um, because the media doesn't talk about this, right? The corporate media doesn't really talk about this. Like, you don't hear about um, the Amazon warehouse strikes on CNN or Fox News or MSNBC or ABC or, or, or NBC or whatever, whatever the fuck it is. Uh, you just don't hear about it there. And, and, the, and there's a reason for that. And that's because their advertisers are Amazon and Target and Walmart and McDonald's. And they don't want the fucking advertisers to look bad. Right. So, so, so they're not going to they're not going to show you that a bunch of workers from their advertisers are striking because their advertisers treat their employees like they're garbage, which is what these companies do. They treat their employees like they're fucking garbage. Uh, and that's why they're going to strike. They're like, hey, we want to be treated like people and not like garbage. Uh, you have the, the I think the wealth gap. Uh, boy, I got to double check this number. Uh, and if you if you know the answer to this and you uh, f comment below and we'll look at it at the end of the segment. Um, but I think it's like over 500 times between a CEO like the, the pay gap is. Uh, uh, the CEO makes 500 times that of a, uh, of a, um, uh, entry level employee, uh, or, or a minimum wage worker, which is like, holy shit. That's crazy. Like in the eighties, I think it was like maybe 50 times. If you were a CEO, you made like 50 times that of the average employee of the entry level employee. Uh, and we've jumped up like tenfold. It, it's it's an exponential boost now um, for them. So um, I think the tipping point, though, of all these strikes is going to come uh, when we see healthcare workers 
join in on this. I know I've said this before. I've, 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 I've said this at the very, very beginning when all of these strikes were starting to happen. Back in March, I made a video. If you, uh, I don't know if any, if you, if if you guys watch it now, we're we're watching that video. But I'll 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 reiterate the point because I think it it is it deserves to be reiterated. And that is, um, that when healthcare workers start striking, that's when we're going to start seeing a tipping point. Um. And they're and they're going to strike for virtually. I think I think the strikes from the healthcare workers will be for the same reasons that we are seeing strikes from Amazon and Instacart, McDonald's, Target, Shipped, meat packers, the sanitation department, or the, the, the sanitation workers. They've all been striking for uh, hazard pay um, to be given the equipment that they need, the PPEs that they need uh, to do their jobs. Um, uh, they are, they don't have paid sick leave. Uh, they're, they're, they don't have corporate transparency in where they're working. Uh, you know, uh, they, and they want health coverage. They want better pay. They want better work conditions. They want deep, clean sanitate, uh, 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 sanitizing of their, of their work environments during the global pandemic. All of these things are pretty reasonable things to, uh, to ask for these are basic human rights to just treat them like they're people um, and doctors and nurses have been kind of going through the same thing too is you know there's a lot of reports about doctors and nurses taking pay cuts um, they've, they've had to work extreme hours they ha don't have the necessary equipment that they need to do their job they don't have the PPEs right there's there's stories about doctors that in hospitals that have basically said hey um, take your n95 mask and just spray it down with some disinfectant and just use it again. Um, which is like, that's not the healthiest way to fucking do that shit. And the reason why I think that, that, that when healthcare workers strike will be the tipping point, um, where, where they'll have to take these strikes a lot more seriously and it becomes unignorable by corporate media is because corporate media right now is uh, and 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 Democrats and conservatives alike, Democrats and Republicans alike, they keep claiming that these guys are heroes, right? You you see Highmark and UPMC and all of these big giant hospitals and corporate insurance companies that, that come out and they're like, oh, these hospital workers are heroes. They are bigger than life. They are they are the front line heroes and heroines out there they are kicking ass and taking names but we're not gonna help give them the things that they need because they're heroes they can get it done even when we don't give them what they need because they're heroes baby because they're heroes they wear capes into the hospital it's not sanitary but they can do it because they're heroes we, they put them up on this pedestal while still tearing them down. And, uh, and once they kind of get sick of it, once your heroes are like, hey, you're treating us like bullshit, you will see a, 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 a shift probably with the way corporate media starts treating them. Um, you will probably see a lot of narratives of uh, go a lot of narratives that push against doctors and nurses and healthcare workers. Which, by the way, healthcare workers like the administrators that are in the hospitals, the janitorial staff, the cafeteria staff. There's a lot of different people that work within the hospital environment. A lot of people that are that are you know sharing the same air and sharing the same environment with sick people. It's not just doctors and nurses, and we already are seeing cafeteria workers in some um, some hospitals across the country just kind of look at the conditions and be like, "This is ridiculous." Like, there's people getting you know getting COVID nineteen right now, and they're and they're not, um, you know, they're they're not shutting down the place. They're not sanitizing the environments. Uh, so, you know, and and part of the reason why some people uh, like what like one of the things that have that I've seen crop up this pattern that I've seen crop up uh, of why there, you know, why there aren't enough ventilators and masks and gloves and all of these safety equipment for doctors and nurses trying to treat people when they have this disease is uh, well, there's a business side to it. 
There's a business side to medicine, right? We got to look at the industry. We got to look at the money. We got to balance the budgets. We got to look at how much human life is worth. Because the life of a board member at the hospital is significantly higher than a plebe that comes into the hospital. The fact that there is a business and commerce side to healthcare really shows you how morally bankrupt capitalism is. That's all that shows. <laughs> Where we're crunching numbers over the life of a human being. It really shows you how morally bankrupt the system is. But we keep calling them heroes, right? We keep calling them essential, and then we keep treating them like shit. You know, Nancy Pelosi will, will sit there and say, oh, we're heroes, and we, and we have these OSHA regulations. We're not enforcing them, but we have them. That's pretty good. And it's like, you're not enforcing them. You're not enforcing the regulations that make sure that these people are in safe working environments that are getting paid properly and appropriately they're there but we can't well jeffy b will get mad at us jeffy bezos he'll he'll get mad and, and there's a vein that pops up on his forehead it's very scary it's very it looks like a vampire bat that's terrifying because you never know when that vein could just turn into dracula and suck your blood it's very scary They don't do anything. They don't spend. They don't. They don't actually fund what these people need. They'll spend. They, they spend millions of dollars on those advertisements. I hear that shit. Um, uh, on on my Spotify. Uh, you know, I'm I'm transitioning out of Spotify. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've been I've been doing that for for the last couple of months. Uh, cause I had a whole bunch of shit on, on Spotify, but like, even when I listen to Spotify, there's, there's like, we'd like to thank our heroes, our doctors and our nurses and our essential workers. This is high Mark blue cross blue shield thanking the, our work. And it's like, how much fucking money did that ad cost you? How much money did, did an ad saying, thank you, essential workers fucking splattered across times square cost you? couple million one billion dollars how many like that could have been so many n95 masks that could have been so many ventilators that could have been so many gloves that could have been creating triage centers that actually fucking work but instead they were just like what if it's the superficial thing so that we don't get people realizing that medicare for all can actually work and then they spent $1.32 million on a fighter jet display when you could have you could have bought so many fucking masks and ventilators and gloves and every single kind of PPE that you could possibly imagine. The, all this shit, all the spending on advertising and fighter jets, so irresponsible, so irresponsible. And eventually, there will come a point where I think the healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, administrators, cafeteria staff, janitorial staff, all of them, every single person that works in the healthcare field, um, will get sick of it. And then that'll push us closer into a general strike. That'll push us a lot closer into a general strike. I... I mentioned this at the top of this video is I think that uh, work and labor are going to be um, the central focal points um, to drive change in this country, to, to, to push for a lot of the progressive ideas that we have been talking about, right? Um, universal basic income, bettering minimum wage, uh, debt consolidation, free college, Medicare for all. All of those things, I think, can be used as part of our demands as, uh, for a general strike. Um, and I think, I think it, it comes out of the labor movement because, you know, people define themselves by what they do. That's, I know lots of people that are out of work and they feel completely lost, unsure of what to do, can't figure out how to be more creative in this situation. 
because they've lost their sense of identity and their sense of purpose because they wrap it all up into work, into what they do. And you can, I mean, that's what the lockdown protest chaos was. Part, part of the lockdown protest chaos came from not having this sense of purpose, came from losing their sense of identity. And they got scared and they didn't know what to do. So they were like, Bop, rights, I'll, let's yell about rights. And then they fucking went out there. You know, some people just wanted a haircut. I get it. Uh, I'm not saying it's everywhere. This is, I don't, I, I'm not trying to make sweeping generalizations, but I'm saying part of the reason behind that was the fact that your work, our work, people's work, what they do defines who they are. It's a difficult thing for me too, is I'm, you know, my, my job is being a performer, um, going and touring around the country, live performances. And I've had to adapt that. I've had to change that. And it's, it was very difficult, but you have to look beyond just when this one I'm really trying to say is you are, your, your be all end all of your identity and your purpose in this world is not just, it doesn't end, uh, at your job. You are, a, a more complex individual than just whatever your nine to five is. Uh, so, you know, but, but so much of who we are is rooted in that. And once that starts going away and, and people start seeing things for the way they are, they'll push back, they'll push back. Much like the lockdown protesters did. I think they were, immensely misguided in what they were doing but the government kind of caved in right there's a lot of places going yellow which i was very confused when that fucking happened uh <laughs> like <laughs> when they were like the states are going yellow and i was like what are, they, are we pissing on each other what's happening this is a weird thing to say what's happening are we all drinking mellow yellows what's is that coming back that's a weird thing uh Basically, it's like things are okay. Things are kind of okay. Um, so they're they're going to start reopening, you know, a bunch of bunch of businesses and states. Uh, and um, I think we're going to see a rise in numbers of cases again, pending pending how many tests we're doing. Right? I think right now they're they're saying like we're we're going to approach a hundred thousand deaths. That's. Uh, that's a, I think, a low estimation because there's so many people that haven't been tested. Um, so, I think the numbers are probably a lot higher. But again, without testing and without a treatment plan, to me, a lot of what what's going on ends up becoming moot. Uh, so, you know, we got to try to kind of take care of ourselves. And this this reopening of the economy, this quote unquote reopening of the economy. Um, also gets the federal government and the state government to essentially let businesses fail on their own. They're operating at half capacity. They're operating at, you know, one fourth capacity or whatever. If they can't make rent, if they can't keep up on their, on their expenses and they, and they kind of go under the government's like, well, you know, we, Hey, they had the opportunity. We laid out the opportunity. The potential was there. The potential was there. They could have done it, but they didn't. But the well, it really it, it really lets them put that bootstraps ideology that they love, right? Uh, this it, it it lets them run this economic Darwinism uh, that uh, that you see from the federal government that you see from people like. Nancy Pelosi and, and Mitch McConnell, specifically those two, because those two are really the bill stoppers. They're the ones that really prevent any sort of progressive legislation to go through. But I do think that all of this stuff is going to start pissing a lot of people off. And if, if, they, if they channel that anger into the right thing, we can see a general strike. And once all of the workers stand together in solidarity, we've seen this before, Seattle general strike. We had a, a general strike in San Francisco that was immensely successful in 1934 during the Great Depression that got people collective bargaining, that got people to recognize unions, that got CEOs and, uh, you know, robber barons and shit to recognize unions because they were like, oh, these people are ready to murder us because we keep taking away all of their things. Um, 
and I'm not saying a strike has to be violent. A strike is a peaceful, nonviolent form of resistance. Uh, but I mean, once you start seeing how how there is a system in place that is setting up people to fail, and it's starting to become more evident and taking away people's definition based on their work. I feel like if you channel that into into this into this into the strike narrative, we can start achieving a lot more things. And I think we're heading in that direction. And I think even if even if we see everything opening back up again, that doesn't mean everything is solved. It just it it's it's tricking you into a sense of complacency that doesn't exist. Uh, so I think work and labor, even in a post-COVID world, we're gonna fucking see that be the really the thing that drives uh, drives uh, uh, you know a, a lot of progressive change forward. Before we go into the second one, I'm gonna take a look at your comments, uh, Andrew. Uh, are like a third of comedy clubs uh, closed like after the last recession? Um, I don't know. Um, I think the comedy clubs are probably going to attempt to come back first. You're looking at comedy clubs that can seat anywhere between, um, depending on the size of the comedy club. Uh, you know, th I perform in a lot of smaller comedy clubs that are anywhere between 25 to you know 100 seats i think the bigger ones the bigger corporate chains um are probably going to stick around and they're probably going to try to open up and then try to get the celebrity comedians to come in uh but even then it's like the the major problem with reopening in terms of entertainment is a lot of people still have rent to worry about and uh utility bills F grocery bills, credit card bills, debt, none of that stuff got frozen. None of that stuff got stopped. Even my stuff, like I got a couple of, I got a couple of my bills deferred, but the interest is still going on them. And I, and I tried to fight them to be like, this doesn't make any fucking sense. And no matter who I talk to, they're like, some of them are like, yeah, we know. So it's the thing, all these people have all these bills. They're not going to go pay, you know, $150 to go see Jeff Dunham and his puppets at the at the you know the local improv or whatever um so i i i think um i don't know what's going to happen to the comedy clubs it's it's also not a world that i am particularly connected to because a lot of these corporate comedy clubs don't particularly book me um so i don't have the same relationship with them i have a relationship with the smaller venues the smaller clubs like the church of satire or the idiot box or you know guillermo's coffee house uh, uh you know the 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 pnh in memphis like these are the little places that i i go perform at um on a regular basis and i'm i do i'm doing a series on my podcast uh every single week where i'm talking to small business um small business owners and small venues across the country. And the pulse that I'm getting is they're hanging in there uh, and they're really being supported by their fans. Um, I don't really know the situation with the corporate chains because uh, no one's no one wants to talk to, talk to me <laughs> at these corporate chains. So, um, but I do think that even if they have their capacity, they'll be able to make it through a lot easier than the smaller venues will. Um, so the smaller venues still have to be a lot more careful because they're more intimate and more, you know, more, more tightly, uh, tightly seated. So there's less of an opportunity for them to socially distance and economically speaking, it's also not worth it for them to socially distance. Um, so, uh, I'm going to get to Jay's comment in just a second. Who will come? Entertainment is the first non-necessity to go. Yeah, exactly. So. In, in terms of you have to you have to kind of consider like people are people are scared um but not just that like as an entertainer right now is like i don't know if i feel comfortable performing in a live space when we don't have the necessary testing and treatment options especially for poor people just i don't i just don't feel comfortable with it i also don't feel comfortable with telling people to come out um and, and do it that's my personal choice i know there's some people that feel uh, the opposite, and there are some venues that are making the uh, live entertainment world work. And I think what's going to happen is you're going to see a lot more local performers in your communities, um, kind of 
take the first step, they're going to kind of be the guinea pigs. You're going to see a lot of local performers go up on stage to entertain some people if they choose to. Uh, and if the venue can adequately provide safety measures to ensure that people aren't, you know, doing what they're doing in Ocean Beach right now, which is just jam packing people onto a boardwalk with no masks and, you know, and just hanging out like everything is just fine. Uh, so it's really, really going to be dependent on how the establishments uh, determine to move forward and how they can put safety protocols in place. Uh, Jay, oh man, your quote, your your quote, one of my favorite movies. You are not your job. You are not how much money you have in the bank. You are not the car you drive. You are not the contents of your wallet. You are not your fucking khakis. You are <laughs> you are all singing, all dancing crap of the world. That's uh, Chuck Palahniuk's Fight Club. Uh, yeah, that is seriously. It's one of my favorite movies. One of my favorite books. Uh, that it like def, def, kind of defined <laughs> that like rebellious streak for me. Uh, but yeah, it's he he makes that that's sort of the valid point that he makes in that. And that is like those are all aspects of you, but they are they are not the the definitive. Um, I have comedian friends that are kind of going through an identity crisis right now. And it's, you know, it, because they've never thought about anything other than being a comedian. Um, and uh, I, I, I never, that's just not how my personality was hardwired. Um, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm talking to them to be like, what else do you like to do? Wh who, what else is an aspect of your personality? Uh, and it's hard. We're going to look at Jay's comment. Uh, certain venues are starting to open, open up and do live comedy again here. Uh, they're switching and sterilizing mics, telling comics that they must wear masks when off stage, and limiting number of people to a table. Uh, I'm still staying my black ass at home, at least for the month, maybe longer. Yeah, um, me too, Jay. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen, to be honest. Uh, before all of this reopening stuff was happening, um, I was looking at April, August to maybe see if venues are comfortable opening back up and talking to venues about trying to book a tour. Uh, but it's likely to be pushed backward. Actually, speaking of, uh, I have to talk to Guillermo's in Little Rock uh, to see what their what their what their thoughts are and what the. Uh, what the consensus for August is going to be. So that's that's going to probably end up being uh, a point of conversation in the next week or two with a bunch of venues that I... Uh, but, you know, one of the things from talking to, talking to these small venues and stuff is really there's no answer on how quickly things are going to kind of get back to normal in terms of the live performance uh subject i guess it's just like people people just don't know they're just like we have no fucking clue we're i mean everybody's just testing the waters at this point hey thank you so much for checking out this video if you enjoyed it uh please give it a like and please subscribe to my channel for uh for more there's gonna be daily videos going up uh on this channel uh i am also uh going to be performing virtual live stand-up comedy shows via Zoom. Uh, I've done a couple of these, and they've been super, super fun. So thank you to all the people that have already purchased tickets and uh, come out to these shows on a regular basis. They're, they're pretty fun. I'm going to be doing them every single Friday in the month of June. Tickets are available for those right now on my website at krishmohan.com. So it's June 5th, June 12th, June 19th, and June 26th going at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, if you're in the other time zones, I think you can figure out what, what time that <laughs> these shows are going to be on. Uh, they are going to be, each show is going to be a little bit different. They're going to be covering topics like the one uh, in the video that you just watched. Uh, again, you can grab your tickets at krishmohan.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N every Friday at June, 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and uh, if you are a sustaining member, you get a free ticket to every single one of these shows, uh, and you can become a sustaining member over uh, on my website as well. 
and uh, I know pe I know times are tough. Uh, so if you are in a financially precarious situation, please send me a message uh, or an email, and I will happily give you a code that will get you a uh, a free ticket to attend these shows. Uh, I'm also releasing my brand new stand-up comedy album, which if you're a sustaining member, you get an early uh, early release version of early uh, early copy of. Uh, it is available on my Bandcamp page to pre-order right now, and it comes out June 1st. So you can go to ramennoodlescomedy.bandcamp.com, get your uh, get your copy of it uh, for only a dollar. You can pre-order it for only a buck. If you want to donate a little bit more, that would be awesome as well. Uh, there are more videos like this coming up. I'm I'm going to be doing uh, a bunch of live streams pretty regularly from my Facebook page and uploading and releasing videos via the YouTubes and uh, and the on the audio podcast versions as well. So stay tuned. Make sure that you like, make sure that you share, and make sure that you're subscribed to these pages because content like this often gets uh, gets suppressed. So uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for hanging out. And uh, till the next one, we'll see you on the road. Thanks.